Hi everyone. This is Miriam Naime from Newcastle University and the Alan Turing Institute. Welcome to our SuperGen Smart Charging Webinar. We're currently having a series on cybersecurity in collaboration with the International Energy Agency Task 43 on Vehicle Grid Integration. The webinar is an activity of the Vehicle Grid Integration Group at the Alan Turing Institute. The Turing is the national institute in the UK for AI and data science. And one of the objectives of the institute is to apply data science to real world problems, such as what we are doing at the Vehicle Grid Integration Group, where we are helping to decarbonize the transport and electricity infrastructure. On the webinar, we've had several talks on the communication protocols for the electric vehicle ecosystem. We also had talks on uh, regional and national plans for the rollout of electric vehicle infrastructure. And we have, and we had some companies sharing with us some of their activities in the real world when it comes to smart charging. You can find the previous slides on our landing page, where you can also find details about upcoming webinars. We are uploading all the videos on our YouTube playlist. So if you search for smart charging webinar, you should find all this information. We recently published a paper in energy informatics in collaboration with a colleague uh, in DTU in Denmark. And what this graph is showing is the different entities and actors in the electric vehicle ecosystem. So on the bottom of the graph, we are seeing the battery electric vehicle. And this is connected to the battery electric vehicle supply equipment, which we also call the charging point. Now the charging point can be controlled by a third party operator directly or through an energy management system. Now the third party operator can be an energy supplier, an aggregator, a charge point operator. We did not want to limit who can control that charge point because the roles can change and will change in the future. Now in that paper, we're making the case for open standards. So we want those entities to speak very few languages instead of every entity speaking their own language. Because if that happens, then we have a fragmented infrastructure. The other point we're making here is that there are so many entities and there is a lot of data that needs to be exchanged between these entities. So it is important that we trust the system with the data exchanged, with the control uh, commands that are exchanged through the system. And that's why we need to talk about cybersecurity, not just about the communication that I just mentioned, but also the cybersecurity of the hardware and the software. And as part of the series, we're trying to tackle some of the challenges and uh, talk about some of the uh, learnings, maybe from other sectors. So I'm really delighted to have Andrew Tierney with us today. Andrew will bring a different perspective from, uh, from, uh, from the energy, from transport. Uh, and Andrew worked with uh, works as a team lead uh, for hardware at Pentest Partners. And uh, he works in IoT, phones, cars, ships, and uh, many, other, many other things. And on the automotive sector, I'm always interested to mention that he reverse engineered the Tesla Model S. And uh, today he'll talk about how we establish identity and trust in the automotive sector, and how we can link it to EV charging. And he also mentioned other things such as the new development in blockchain and micropayments and that, how they could fail. So uh, if you do have questions, please leave them um, at the chat box and we'll take the answers at the end of the uh, session. So now without further ado, Andrew, over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, hopefully you can see that now. Um, I'm going to be talking about identity um, in the automotive and machine to machine arena. Um, so who am I? Well, uh, there's a good introduction there. Uh, I'm Andrew Tierney. Uh, I work at Pentest Partners and I work on hardware. I do all the stuff that isn't normal computers. Um, so 
you might know me as Cyber Gibbons on Twitter. Um, that's kind of, I do a lot of YouTube, a lot of other presentations and things like that. So what are we going to be talking about today? Well, we're going to be looking at connected cars. I think they're quite closely related to the EV infrastructure. Obviously, they're part of it. We're going to be talking about cryptography, identity, trust, how safety can sometimes override security. And then we're going to do a little bit about EV chargers at the end. So what is a connected car? Well, cars are becoming more and more connected all the time. We started off with remote unlocking. So you can use your mobile app to unlock uh, your car. Teslas do that. A lot of more expensive cars do that. You've got the infotainment system. So it can deliver media, radio, other different content over the internet, delivers internet to the passengers, navigation data, can take vehicle diagnostics, send it through to the dealership so they can alert you if there's a problem with your car. You can call roadside assistance. There's e-call in most uh, European cars. So you can press a button if you crash your car or you're stuck. Um, you've got stolen vehicle tracking, remote stop if someone's stolen your vehicle. You've got the really interesting areas of V2X. So that's vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure where data from a vehicle is being transferred to a city, to a road infrastructure, to other vehicles so they can make the most of infrastructure. And you've got this concept of big data, gathering everything from vehicles, analyzing that, and then trying to develop more interesting things from there. So connected cars are becoming very popular. What enables a connected car? Well, you've got to start with the car. Now, when we think about a vehicle, we think about things called CAN bus networks. So CAN bus is just a simple two wire network. Now, the most obvious parts of a car are things like the, the motors, the charger, the battery, the inverter, the instrument cluster, the steering, the motor, the ADAS, so um, the driver assist functions. They're all connected on a bus, but that doesn't connect out anywhere else. We also added lots and lots of other devices. So most vehicles nowadays, the seats will be connected to a CAN bus, the locks will be connected to CAN bus, the wing mirrors, the lights, the heating, the suspension, the wipers, everything is connected to a CAN bus. Now you don't want to share those high risk CAN buses, the things with the motors on, with your seats. So we have something called a BCM or a body control module. And that body control module acts as a gateway between these two different networks, providing some security. But then we need to connect this out to the internet. And we generally do that using two devices, the IVI, the in-vehicle infotainment or the head unit, and a TCU, a telematics control unit. And that telematics control unit is pretty much a cellular modem with a little computer sat on it, and it will connect out to the cloud. So this is how we connect a car to the internet, to a different platform, so it can share its data, so it can command it. You can see it's already getting quite complex, and this is a simplified diagram of a vehicle. So the telematics control unit really is just a small black box. It's generally got a cellular modem in it, so it can connect out. It will have a SIM card in it. It will have GPS, and it will connect through to the CAN buses on the vehicle. From a security perspective, it's a real focal point for us. If we can compromise this, generally we can make the car do bad things. So that's what we're, we're generally looking for when we want to compromise a vehicle. Now, there's certain key terms here in cryptography that we want to define and understand and how they can impact the security of vehicles and IoT systems. The first one is confidentiality. So that's preventing someone from determining the content of the messages that you're sending. Pretty simple definition. So we normally do that using encryption. So what we do is we take a plain text message. Your password is cheese123. We encrypt it. We end up with a cipher text. We can send that and it can be decrypted at the other end. Now, the thing is, an attacker can then not see the content of the message. It's confidential. So we use encryption to do that. Now, confidentiality is actually quite difficult to ensure without also checking the authenticity of the person you're speaking to. So what is authenticity? Well, we'll come on to that in a second. So when is confidentiality important? Well, what is your password? We don't want people to know what your password is when it's sent across the internet. So confidentiality is important there. What are your credit card details? Again, you don't want to leak them to everybody. We keep them confidential. And how do we protect a user's privacy? So that's contact data, location data, photos on their phone. They want to remain confidential. So what is authenticity? It's ensuring that an entity or a message are genuine. So we're making sure that they're genuine. That's what authenticity is. Now, the common way that we do that is signing. So if I want to tell my bank to send £10,000 to Dave, what I do is I will sign a message that says send £10,000 to Dave. The bank will check that signature, they'll verify it, and then if they think it's correct, they'll send £10,000 to Dave. 
the idea of this is is an attacker cannot come along and send ten thousand say send ten thousand pounds to eve and sign it themselves with and the bank will not be able to verify this it won't be the right signature now we can use digital signatures they're unforgeable compared to the signatures we're used to with a pen um, so that's authenticity checking a message is genuine so when is authenticity important is that key fob meant to unlock the car so when you walk up to your car and you press the unlock button to unlock your vehicle what you're actually checking for there is to see if that fob's genuine or not you don't care if the message is confidential or not you just care that it's genuine is that firmware from the manufacturer if you're updating the firmware on your vehicle you want to make sure if it's a bmw that that firmware actually came from bmw and not from a malicious attacker and when you're talking about vehicle infrastructure vehicle to vehicle you want to know did that data actually come from that car could someone create data from fake cars can they inject data into the platform that's not genuine so authenticity can be really really important as well now there's different kinds of encryption that we tend to use um, one of the things that we use is called um, symmetric encryption uh, common ones there are aes aes128 des um, and what that means by symmetric is that we're using the same key to encrypt and decrypt the message so both ends need to have a copy of the same key to encrypt and decrypt a message now the problem is how do i get that key from one end to the other well that can actually get quite challenging so if i'm encrypting it with a symmetric key i need to get that key from my end to the other end now i don't have an encrypted channel so how do i do that an attacker can come along if i just send it in the plane get hold of that key and now they can decrypt my communications themselves so key distribution actually becomes really really challenging so some very clever people came up with something called asymmetric or public key cryptography now here we have two different keys we have a private key i've denoted that as a red key now the private key shouldn't be shown to anybody else no one should be able to see that key just the person who owns it and there's a public key that corresponds to that private key now you can share that public key the clues in the name so you can give that to anybody it doesn't it doesn't leak anything about the private key so you have this key pair that we can use so why is this different well what it means is that someone can encrypt data with the public key and it can only be decrypted with that private key now that's very very powerful that means that i could give you my public key you could encrypt data with it and the only person who can decrypt it is me the person with the private key so this means it's easier to share a key with anybody in the internet and still keep data confidential now we can flip that on its head and we can do something called digital signing so here what we're doing is we're taking our private key and we're signing some data with it it puts a signature on it and that signature can be verified with our public key so we're signing with the private key and it can be verified with the public key as i said anybody can take my public key there's no risk in giving it to them so that means that anybody can validate that i signed that message with my private key and that provides authenticity so this this public key cryptography allows anybody to encrypt data that only i can decrypt and it allows me to sign data that anybody can validate that i signed correctly so these are two very powerful techniques they go hand in hand so we're just flipping the public and private key purposes there so this is okay there's a problem with public key cryptography though it doesn't really like working with lots and lots of data it's quite slow it uses a lot of memory a lot of processor so we don't tend to actually use it day to day to encrypt everything that we do so encryption can hide the content so we can keep it confidential and signing shows who said it so we encrypt to keep it confidential we sign it to show that it's genuine so confidentiality and signing now in the real world what we actually do is we establish a communications channel using public key cryptography so we're encrypting the data with a public key and then what we do is we generate a symmetric key so that's the yellow key on the left there so we take that symmetric key and what we do is using public key cryptography we send it from one end to the other 
So that means that no one, apart from the person with the private key, could decrypt that message. So now we know that we've got hold of one copy of the symmetric key, the other end's got the other copy of the symmetric key. We then establish a symmetric communication channel. So that public key cryptography, the slow one that's, that's quite heavy on CPU resources, is used to transfer a symmetric key and then we use that for all communications from that point onwards. This is how TLS or SSL HTTPS works on the internet. Your computer generates a session key and it then encrypts it with the public key of the website, sends it through to the website and the website has then got a copy of that symmetric key to continue communication. But that still hasn't solved all of the problems. How, does, how do we get hold of that public key from the website? Well, the website actually sends us a copy of its public key. So it sends us the public key. We then encrypt our symmetric key, send it through to the other end. The problem is, is how do we know that that public key is genuine? An attacker can come along, a malicious party, and they can pretend to be the web server. If they then send me their public key, I'll encrypt my symmetric key with their public key and they'll be able to decrypt the communications. So again, we haven't checked that that party at the other end is authentic or genuine. So although we've got a channel that is confidential, no one arbitrary on the internet can intercept or sniff that communication. If someone can pretend to be the endpoint, pretend to be the server, they can still see what I'm sending to them. So again, it's confidentiality and authenticity playing off against one another. We need to always check that the entity we're speaking with is authentic. That's what the bulk of TLS or SSL is, actually. It's making sure that when I go to barclays.com to log into my banking website, it checks that that website is actually who it says it is. And we'll come on to how it does that. So authenticity is actually often more important than confidentiality. That's really my opinion. It's not a fact, but I think in most systems, authenticity is the more important of the two. So how do we deal with authenticity? Well, I always find it's helpful to come back to how humans speak with each other. Who are you? How do we identify you? And, and how do you prove that? Um, and we think about the way we do that between people and we can identify the way that those different things fail between people. And it's the same with machines. Machines and humans, the way they identify are all very similar. So when I meet someone, the most common identifier that I use is my name. I say, hi, I'm Andrew Tierney. My appearance contributes to my identity. I look, people have seen photos of me. People know what I look like and that contributes to my identity. We also use signatures. So we sign bits of paper. We've got things like passports, which are kind of close to the way that we actually authenticate with websites. What we've done is we've taken an external trust entity, a passport issuing authority. They check I am who I say I am give me a passport, and then other people trust that passport. Now, the problem is, is there's lots of ways that this can fail. Now, if Bob can't see John in this situation, all he can see is his name and his signature, what can happen is someone can come along, Eve, an evil person, and they can take John's name, they can take John's signature, and they can just use it. It's not, there's not a strong link between the person, the name, and the signature. So you see that. If you send your signature and your name through, uh, through the post to someone to identify yourselves, it can be cloned quite easily. The other problem is Eve, the evil person, can actually take your name and signature and clone it and use it in lots and lots of different places. Your identity isn't tied to you strictly. There's no way for me to validate that you're using that identity at that moment in time. So I can take someone's identity, I can store it, I can clone it. So there's problems here. The other thing is, is we don't actually have a good way of checking ID of people. Now, I, I'm a security consultant. I, I visit a lot of buildings to test the security of their networks or internal systems. And I turn up at reception and I go, hi, I'm Andrew Tierney. I'm here to test your security. They let me in. They let me sit down at a desk. Normally, they don't check my identity in the slightest. They just know that they were expecting a guy called Andrew Tierney. So my signature might be completely different. My appearance could be completely different. They've just checked the name. They've not strongly checked my identity. And we see this with machines all of the time. Now, hopefully you've, you've all heard of something called a MAC address on a computer, on a network device. 
So what it is, it's six bytes of data. It's designed to be unique and it should uniquely identify your computer on a network. So you can see the format of it there. So it's six bytes, so 12 hex characters, and it should be unique. Now, because it's unique and it's on everything that's got a network card, a Wi-Fi card, people use it as an identifier. It's a unique identifier. It's very convenient that it's on there. So it sounds like a good idea to use something that's unique as an identifier. Um, names don't hold that property. There's more than one Andrew Tierney. So what we find a lot of the time is that people use MAC address to identify devices to platforms. So they'll take a MAC address of a network thing and they'll say, hi, this is, my, this is my ID, this is who I am. And then the server will take that MAC address and say, hi, you are who you say you are. Now the problem is, is that we can just clone that MAC address. Now the MAC address is actually sent on the local network. If it's Wi-Fi, we can sniff it, we can hear it from the air around in range of that device. So an attacker can come along and they can say, hi, I'm this device, and the server will just believe them. So it's just an identity, just a number. It's not a strong identity. We can clone it, we can fake it. We can even brute force it. You'll notice that the MAC address there, it only consists of six bytes of data. The first three are called the OUI, the Organizational Unit Identifier. And they're constant for a, for a ThinkPad, they're all the same. For a MacBook, they're all the same. It's only those last three that actually vary. And quite often, they're sequential. If you look at three bytes there, you've only got 16 million different options. That means I could brute force, I could go through all 16 million MAC addresses that are available for a given device and see if the server responds to me and says, hi, I know who you are. So there's problems with using MAC addresses, but it's a very, very common way that dev devices identify. Now we've saw this in play. Um, as was mentioned, we spent a lot of time reverse engineering the Tesla. Um, the goal was mainly the firmware update mechanism, but we also looked at how it connects through to what they call the mothership. They actually call it the mothership. So every Tesla vehicle, a few years ago at least, had a VPN connection back to the mothership. Now that VPN connection had a unique set of credentials stored in every Tesla. It was keyed to the VIN number of the vehicle. So it's the vehicle identification number, which again should be unique. But it was a key and certificate for a VPN. So it was genuinely unique. And it established this yellow encrypted tunnel between the vehicle and Tesla's mothership. Then within there, it just had a simple web client running within the car and a web server on their end. And we made requests with that VIN number saying, have you got a new firmware update for my VIN? Um, you know, what features are enabled for this VIN and things like that. Now, the idea was, was that the VPN connection with the given VIN number shown there matched the web client. So it sent it from one end to the other and the other end believed I was that VIN number. That's a quick uh, screenshot showing the certificate from a vehicle that we had. Um, I've blanked out the VIN number um, because it's, an, it's still a live vehicle. Tesla have killed this VPN method now. They moved on to something different. You can see there it expired on May the 31st, 2018. I don't know what they're actually using now. The problem was, was that we found that with those VPN certificates, we couldn't forge one of those, but we could forge what the web client was doing. So we could change the VIN number so as an attacker, I've denoted that by the little red guy with the skull and crossbones, hopefully it's obvious enough, we could change the VIN number from the genuine one to another VIT car's VIN number, and it would send that through to the other end. Now we broadly call this authentication decoupling. It's when one layer authenticates strongly and then the next layer authenticates weakly. So we've got strong authentication in the VPN, weak authentication to the web client, just with a number. So the VIN number is quite long, actually. But the problem is, of course, is that on most modern vehicles, the VIN number is written on the dash of the vehicle. So you can just walk up to someone's car and get hold of the VIN number. So what we did was we took a VIN number of another Tesla. And once we were connected to the VPN, we provided that through to their servers. And you can see I'm getting some of the de details back for a vehicle here. Now, you can see this vehicle's actually listed as hammered. Um, the VIN number I'm using is from a car that has been uh, written off wrecked. Um, so that's what Tesla calls it, a hammered vehicle. Um, 
it also was telling me other things like you could get position of vehicles and things like this. This issue was fixed though. They stopped arbitrary VIN numbers being provided through to this web service to get this data. But authentication decoupling is a problem we see a lot. So how do we solve this? Well, with the MAC addresses, what we do is we sign a message with a private key. So we're saying, hi, I'm device 156EF379A012, before we could just spoof that. But if we sign that with a private key that only the device knows, then a server using a public key can validate that that message is genuine and real. So that private key on the device signs a message, the server with the public key can validate it's real. We've got more problems though. What happens when we've got 100,000 devices in the field? We've now got 100,000 private keys on devices. We've now got 100,000 public keys that we need to store on the server. Now we could just send the key, the public key from the device through to the server, but then we've got that problem of authenticity. How does the server know that that public key is genuine? And this is where we rely on that passport like mechanism, which we, we use this all the time day to day. So say for example, Bob comes along and he wants John to trust Eve. He'll say, this is Eve. I trust her identity, therefore you should. And then John will say, ah, I trust Eve because you trust Eve. This is what we're doing with passports. The, the passport agency has checked that I live where I live, that I was born when I said I was, that I looked like I said I would, I went to the school, I said my mum is my mum and all these other things. And they give me that passport and I can hand that to other people. We're transferring trust from one entity to another. And we do this with machines. We do this with TLS and SSL. And what we do is we use something called a certificate authority. Now the last presentation uh, was, was about this, using a, a, a certificate authority to generate certificates for devices that can then be trusted. So your laptop has got a bundle of certificate authorities on it. I don't know how many a Windows machine would have on it typically now, over a hundred I'd imagine. And that says, when I go to the Barclays website, I can check that Barclays public key has been signed by a certificate authority that's already on my, my machine. If I'm talking about machine to machine, the server can hold a certificate authority that the public key of all the devices has been signed with. So now I don't need to keep copies of all of those private keys. So these certificate authorities are really important in machine to machine systems. TLS uses an almost identical mechanism. We have that certificate authority and we sign the SSL certificate. It gets very complicated with the trees and things like that, but the idea is fundamentally the same. So coming back to the vehicle, wh wh why does all of this matter? Well, the CAN bus is unencrypted. The messages are just sent in the plane on the whole. But the problem is, is what happens when we're talking about, say for example, instead of the TCU telling the doors to unlock, suddenly the parking sensor is telling the doors to unlock. That doesn't make sense, does it? We're not checking that the message to unlock the doors is genuine or not. What happens if suddenly, instead of the speed coming from the wheel sensors, the speed starts coming from the wing mirror? There's all these different things. These messages can come from different places. And from not checking they're authentic, bad things can happen to the vehicle. The other reason, firmware. All of these individual ECUs in a vehicle have got firmware on them. And they all need their firmware updating from time to time. Now, it's unlikely that your, win your wipers are going to need updating. But things like your TCU, your IVI, the charger, the inverter, the battery uh, management unit, they're all going to need their firmware updating from time to time to either improve performance, fix bugs, or possibly even fix vulnerabilities. Again, how do we make sure that firmware is genuine? And with vehicles, this gets really, really complex, really, really fast. Now, you might think your car's made by BMW, or you might make, think your car's made by VW or Audi or whoever, but in reality, in terms of electronics, they don't really make any of the electronics in a vehicle anymore. You've got things called tier ones. So big tier ones, Bosch, Ficosa, Continental, they all make lots and lots of different ECUs. So one might make your body control module, one might, might make your remote keyless entry, your tire pressure monitoring system, all these different things, they all get made by different companies and they've all got firmware on them. So they've all got their own keys on them. They've all got their own ways of authenticating with them. How do we actually work out trust when we've got all of these different entities and all of these different devices. Do BMW say 
that there's going to be a certificate authority that needs to be trusted by every single device in that vehicle. What happens then if that ECU is used in a BMW and a VW? Do they trust both certificate authorities? Or do we have a Continental, a Focosa and a Bosch certificate authority? It gets complicated really, really rapidly. And I don't think this trust problem has been solved yet. Now, I'm sure you've all seen things like flight radar, flight tracker that allow you to see where planes are. Now, for most commercial jets, they use something called ADS-B. It's mandatory. It's got to be fitted. But on smaller planes, there's a system called FLAM that's quite often used. Now, FLAM, you install it on the plane. It will transmit your position. Other planes can pick it up. It allows you to avoid collisions with other planes. A lot of small aircraft hit each other each year, uh, which results in death and injury. So we want to avoid that thing. Now, they've got challenges here. A FLAM receiver in a plane only wants to accept genuine FLAM messages. If I could spoof the positions of planes in the air by transmitting messages, that would clearly be bad. I could make planes appear that weren't there. I could make it look like something was going to crash into something else. This wouldn't be a good thing. So they, they want to only accept genuine FLAM messages. But at the same time, they want safety to override security. They want to make sure that if two planes think they're going to crash, a slightly corrupted message, an out-of-date firmware on an old device, two planes who've never communicated with one another before can still send a genuine message between each other. So they've got to reach a balance between safety and security. Now, what FLAM did really was they went for safety. It kind of makes sense for what they did. And what they actually did was they hard-coded the key to generate FLAM messages across all of those different devices. So someone took one of their units, reverse engineered the firmware for it, and found the key, published their own code for it. So now we can decode FLAM messages, but we could also send FLAM messages, which could cause impact to the system. So we've kind of broken that security control here. Hopefully, no one's crazy enough to actually genuinely inject messages there. Now, again, I'm sure you've seen this message when you're browsing the internet. Your connection is not private. So generally, what that means is that your browser couldn't use a certificate authority to validate that certificate at the other end. It might have expired. There might be another problem with it. But it's saying, don't go here because your connection's not secure. Now, that's fine when I'm browsing the internet. If this happens, I can either go back and find another website, or I can just press advance, click through, go to the website. It all works fine. It's not the same when you're talking about car braking, though. If I put my foot to the floor in a car, foot on the brake pedal, I want the car to stop. I don't want to get a TLS certificate error from my braking module. That would be a very, very bad thing. So again, how do we deal with this? How do we make it possible so that safety can be guaranteed whilst at the same time it's secure? It's a very, very fine balancing act, and it's not something I really know the solution to. We've got other problems in vehicles, change of ownership. So the Teslas, again, they have this VPN certificate on them, which is key to the vehicle. Now that's fine if I'm just as a normal person selling the car to someone else. They'll take the car away. I won't have a copy of that VPN certificate. Problem is, what happens if an evil guy comes along, takes a car, copies the certificate, and then gives me the car afterwards? They've got a copy of that permanent credential. So the Tesla doesn't roll those credentials every time a new owner comes along. So how could we sort that? Again, it's a complex problem. You could quite easily end up in a denial of service situation where, say, for example, you claimed the ownership of a vehicle that someone else already owned, the credentials roll forward to ones for you, and the other person gets locked out. So I mentioned when we're looking at the vehicle with all those ECUs, how do we make sure that they only run authentic, genuine code that's made by the manufacturer or the tier one? Well, we've got two things we use, firmware signing and secure boot. Now, firmware signing is the process of taking a firmware, the manufacturer signs it with their private key, they send it through to the device, and it's verified with a public key that's burned permanently into that ECU. So again, it's this concept of using a private key to sign something that can be validated with a public key. Again, we've got issues here. What happens if that manufacturer goes out of business? What happens if that key gets wiped? What happens if those keys are compromised and need to be changed? From an attacker's perspective, if I can replace the public key in the ECU, that's as bad as getting hold of the private key. It's got serious consequences. If I can replace the public key with my own, that I've got the private key for, 
I can generate a false firmware and inject it onto the device. The other thing we do is called secure boot. And instead of just validating a firmware update as it comes in, what we do is every time the device boots, we use this public private key cryptography to validate the firmware on the device. And it's a similar mechanism. The first stage bootloader will have a public key burnt into it permanently. That will validate the signature of the second stage bootloader, which in itself has got another public key inside it. That will validate the signature of the operating system, which has public keys in it, which will then be used to validate signatures of the applications. So we can check that they've been signed by someone who's only got access to the private key. Now, again, with automotive, there's challenges here. If an ECU in my vehicle crashes, say, for example, the ABS module that does the anti-lock braking, I need that to restart in a very, very short period of time. We're talking, you know, milliseconds from it going from power on to working. All of this checking signatures and stuff like that takes time and slows us down. So again, sometimes secure boot is difficult to do in these high safety um, requirement situations. It also does introduce other problems. I'm sure you've heard of right to repair. So this is, uh, it's a movement really in the US, um, largely because it, it, it's, it's in law. And people are getting frustrated because they, they've lost the ability to repair their vehicles. Um, there's been a very, very big case going on with John Deere tractor makers, where people aren't able to modify or change or repair their tractors, because when they do that, some of the ECUs decide to stop working and you need to take it to a dealer who can use some form of keys or authentication to reset everything and get it working again. We've also got car modification. People like modifying vehicles. They really like being able to change what they do for performance, uh, for economy, just, just the way they look. And again, securing things stops people doing that. And how do we let people actually gain access to them? We've seen some interesting ideas. One concept is that of, of break glass, um, a, a button or a track you scratch off or a part you snap off a PCB. And that signals and says that the, um, that the device is it is now modified that we've changed it and it can be easily verified. We're throwing something away. We're saying, no, let's not warranty this anymore. Let's not provide a guarantee. So it's, it's, it's an interesting balance. Again, I don't know which side of the debate I stand on. There's no right or wrong here. Um, how do we support hardware if a company goes out of business? Again, a vehicle has to be supported in the EU market for quite a long period now. I think it might be, is it six or eight years? Um, maybe, maybe someone knows. But if one of those tier ones goes out of business, they lose a backup, they lose those private keys. How do we actually support that hardware now? Again, these are big challenges when it comes to IoT. Now, EV charging infrastructure, that's going to last a few years. If you put, well, some of it's not at the moment, to be honest, but if you put an EV charger in, you're going to hope that lasts five, six, seven years, really. You're not going to want to renew it like you do your phone every two years. So what has this all got to do with EV charging? Well, I'm going to actually talk about EV charging now. Um, when people think about EV charging, it, it, it's an IoT system. I don't really like thinking about different hardware particularly differently. They're just connected devices, connected embedded systems. Um, cars are just the same. They've just got some specific terminology. So most people, when they think about that, they think of a device, a server, then the attacker comes along and they can attack either the device or they can attack the server. Now, I think this is a really naive view of IoT. When we actually break it down, it gets incredibly complex. So we've got a device, we've got our servers, they're connected to each other. We've got our users. The user might have a local connection through to the device, the EV charger. They might be able to scan a QR code on it. We've then got divide it up into different networks. We've got that internet, the transit network in between it. We're going to have routers in the way, both ends of the connection. We might have other users. We might have people connecting to that device. We're going to have mobile users, people who want to cloud connect and make chargers do things, turn off their charger at home, something like that. We're going to have corporate users. Now that might be support, that might be developers, that might be ops, all different groups inside the company. We've got the routers that sit in between on the network there. We're going to have our DR servers. We're going to have AWS employees. We're going to have our databases. We're going to have our backup databases. It all gets really complicated. And this is even before thinking when the attackers come along. So the attacker comes along and then they can just, they can attack the device. They can attack the user. They could try and attack the cloud. We've got malicious insiders. What happens if someone with an account on the charging platform 
decides to attack it. We could have someone set up an evil hotspot where a mobile user connects to it in a Starbucks, connects through to the device, they intercept communications from the mobile app and they can make it do things. We've got an attacker who wants to bribe employees to do bad things. Then we've just got malicious insiders. Someone can turn bad on the inside. So you can see when you look at an IoT system as a whole, it's really, really complex. And I think people don't really realize this. An EV is like this, but it's also involving lots and lots of different entities. You've got charges made by all different companies. You've got people, energy providers. You've got thousands of different types of cars connecting through to these. Very, very complex, very, very quickly. Now the risk with the cloud and cloud connectivity or, or just IoT in general is that someone comes along and instead of attacking each device individually, they attack the cloud and they can compromise all of the devices one by, well, as a group. Now, th this is always what we're doing when we're pen testing or, or security testing things. We don't just care about the device. We don't care just about the hardware. We generally look at the hardware with the goal of compromising all of the devices at once. So the hardware is part of the picture, but it's not our end goal. Now, you might have heard this saying, physical access means game over. And it kind of held true for, for desktop computers and servers. If you've got prolonged physical access to something, then you can nearly always get the data off of it. Could take a lot of time, effort and money, but you can nearly always get it. The problem is with IoT and charging systems is the device is already in the hands of the attacker. They're on the street, they're being sold, they're exposed to the internet. So we can look at them, we can inspect them. This is why the hardware to us is really important because we can look at that hardware and we can attack it. Now, I'm gonna go on to a specific example. Um, we bought something called an EO charger hub made by a company in the UK. This is all disclosed, the issues have been fixed. This was, this was quite some time ago, almost a year ago. So we bought this device, um, we bought it off a small company um, and it turned up to a small gray box like this. We opened that box and what we found inside was this. Now you might recognize that thing on the right hand side if you've done any kind of hardware tinkering. It's a Raspberry Pi. Now there's problems with this. The Raspberry Pi doesn't support secure boot. There's no way of, of doing secure boot on a Raspberry Pi. So it cannot properly validate the firmware that's running on it. So the solution here really is don't use a Raspberry Pi, use something else. Now secure boot isn't a necessity, it's a nice to have. So I, I will say that. The other thing is, you might have noticed that a Raspberry Pi actually stores its firmware on a micro SD card. This has other issues. We can take that micro SD card out of the device and we can read it. Credentials, anything stored on that immediately can be obtained by us. You could try encrypting the data on it, but the key's also got to be on the SD card so we can get it. So again, if you want to securely store data so a physical attacker can't get it immediately, don't use a Raspberry Pi. Now the next thing, once we got that, was we started looking at the firmware on it. Most of it was written in a Python script. And what we quite quickly found was in those Python scripts were hard-coded credentials. They were the same across all devices. So now we're getting a chain of issues. The fact that we can take any one of these hubs, take the SD card out of it and get credentials that are the same across all of the hubs, now we've got a problem. So hard-coded system-wide credentials have per device credentials. Then you can revoke them per device. If a device is compromised, it might only impact that individual device rather than all of them. We call this a break once, run everywhere or bore attack. So we break one device and we can run it against lots of them or use it in other places. Now, the other thing, I talked about authentication of servers. When I go to barclays.com, half of what my computer is doing is checking that barclays.com is real. Now they had a function called authenticate. And what this did was it sent hello server from EO Linux box. And then the server, if it responded, hello EO Linux box, this is server, it was authenticated. That was it. Just two text messages going backwards and forwards. That's not strong authentication. It's not cryptographic. So the communications don't authenticate the endpoints. And the solution here is don't roll your own encryption. This is invented encryption, invented authentication. Use TLS, open SSL, Libre SSL, all these different libraries exist to do this for you already. The next thing was we did notice that the communications were encrypted between the device and the server. But again, it was a Python script. We reverse engineered it 
or Reddit, I mean. And uh, what we found was there was a hard-coded key for the encryption. So for all devices, the key was the same. So when I communicate with Barclays.com, a session key is generated on my laptop, sent through to their server securely, and then we communicate with that. Not here, the same key for all devices. So we write a little script to decrypt the communications. So again, hard-coded system-wide encryption keys. Maybe if I couldn't remove the SD card trivially from one device and use it against others, that wouldn't be a problem. So we decrypted the communications. And what we found was that the identifier for these was in fact a, um, what is it, a four byte number. So you can see it there highlighted 13900B1. It's provisioned from a server when you first connect it. Um, but again, it's short, it's not cryptographic. We can enumerate it, we can brute force it and find other valid devices. So it's a short, non-cryptographically assured identity. So again, it should have had a key and certificate burnt onto it. They do now have a key and certificate burnt onto them. So that was their fix for the problem. The next thing, it had a firmware update mechanism. So you could update the firmware on these devices. Um, the problem here was, was of course the firmware was encrypted, but there was no signing on it. So they kept the firmware confidential, but they didn't check it was genuine. So problem, the firmware updates encrypted and not signed. So sign the firmware. Now I'm not saying this is typical for a charging system, but it's typical for the internet of things. Um, we're seeing a lot of problems in these areas and they really need to be fixed. Another issue we're seeing with charging is quite a lot of these devices have cellular connections. So they connect back to the internet using a cellular modem, which means they've got a SIM card in them. Now the way that you go between the cellular network and an IP network is called an APN, an access point name. There's one on your phone, normally got a default thing. Now lots of these are public, so it just allows you access to the internet. But we also have ones that are called private APNs. So the credentials are unique um, for a given network. And if I connect to that APN with a given SIM card, I've got a channel normally into a VPN and then access to some servers that I otherwise wouldn't have access to. So it's almost the same as having a VPN. So if I take the SIM card out, I get hold of the credentials, I can use that to access this VPN and access private servers. And we've used this. I took a telematics unit from a vehicle. I took the SIM card out of it. With that SIM card, I could establish a GSM connection through. Using the credentials for the APN, I could connect through to the APN. Then I've got access to a private network. I could then establish an SSL connection through to one of their servers. So it's just TLS, you know, normal encryption going through to a server. And the intent was then that a web client running on the telematics unit would go through to the server and I'd make requests through to it. We found a problem with this, however, and that was that the domain controller and the rest of the corporate network was accessible over that APN connection. So as an attacker, either compromising the TCU or taking the SIM card out, using a SIM card and APN credentials, we got onto the corporate network, we got domain credentials, eventually we got domain admin on that network. So that's complete control of the Windows network, pretty much by taking a SIM card out of a telematics unit. So think about that when you put cellular modems in things. Now I'm just going to wrap up quickly with um, micro payments and some kind of cryptocurrency developments. Now I'm not sure if you've heard of IOTA. They've got a partnership with certain auto manufacturers um, and it's, it's an open source distributed ledger um, and cryptocurrency. And it's designed for the internet of things or so they say. So it's not strictly blockchain. It's a distributed ledger. It's a little bit different, but it's the same kind of concept that you can cryptographically sign data and other people will validate it. So you end up with this big ledger that everybody trusts sat in the middle, like a big database. Now this slide is, this image is stolen from a company called DXC Technology, or stolen rather, I've taken it from their website because um, I'm commenting on what they're saying. And the idea here is that your car is connected to the IOTA network. Your phone's connected to the IOTA network. So your phone transfers funds to your vehicle, and then when you charge your vehicle, micro payments are made through to the charging station. So you're transferring funds using this IOTA network through to the charging station. When you go to get your car fixed, funds are transferred from your vehicle through to the, the dealership. 
when you want to pay for insurance because you can pay per mile for example or pay more if you go faster your car transfers funds using this distributed ledger um, say for example you go through a toll road your car can pay automatically it's kind of a nice idea but again it's kind of ignoring some really big problems the device on the left hand side there is a project called Espiota that's designed to either to, to allow you to consume power if you pay using IOTA. And you can see that QR code on the device. It's got a large QR code. The idea is you walk up to it with your phone, scan the QR code, send the money. It turns on the light. It turns on an a, a air pump or a car wash or something like that. Now, this is being proposed for car chargers. So you can just walk down the street, park your car, plug in, scan a QR code, and pay money and the charger will turn on and you'll get your car charged. But where's the authenticity check? I'm not checking who I'm paying. It's a QR code on a post in the street. Now for IOTA, it changes each time. For that SBOTA product, it has to be an LCD because it will change each time. But again, how do I know that that LCD is actually showing me the company that operates that charger? How do I know the firmware has not been compromised? There's no trust authority. In iota there's no way for me to work out if i should trust that charger there's no way for my car to realize that no i'm not actually going through a toll road what i'm doing is actually someone's stolen a device from a, a toll booth and they're walking past cars on the street so they're not checking they're authentic so again authenticity is quite often more important the other problem with things like iota here is that they try to make you believe that the trust boundary around their system covers everything so the sensor data, the nodes, and the data consumers are all surrounded by trust boundary. No attacker can get inside there. But obviously, from an attacker's perspective, sensor data can always be changed. So if you've got an analog temperature sensor, a light sensor, someone can spoof that data going into the node. But the problem is, as I said before, the devices are in the hands of the attacker. So in reality, that trust boundary gets shrunk right down to be the data consumer. Most of these complex technologies don't deal with the concept of trust. Now, if you've got 15 different car manufacturers with 15 different EV charging companies, how are you going to establish trust between them? I don't know. Authenticity is often more important than confidentiality. So lessons to be learned. Identity. Strong identity should be at the core of all machine to machine systems. Every single IoT device should have a cryptographically assured identity on it. Every system we've seen that doesn't do this ultimately fails in security terms. It should be built in right from the start. Authenticity. The authenticity of entities should always be assured. Whether that's checking that charging point is actually a charging point that it says it is, whether you're that data coming from the car genuinely came from that car, whether I'm making sure I'm actually speaking with Barclays, make sure you check the entity and data are authentic. And lastly, security. Security should be considered from the outset. A lot of systems where we see security failures in, they tried bolting it on at the end. It's very, very difficult to properly secure a Raspberry Pi. But if you use good hardware right from the beginning, if you used a solid, updatable operating system, things would be much easier. So, thanks for listening i hope you learned something from that um and i hope people have got some interesting questions i've overrun by a few minutes sorry um but yeah if anybody's got any questions please fire away thank you andrew no problem at all that was very interesting clear and very much needed information um yes please if people have questions if they can leave them in the chat box i noticed a couple but before i take them so with how many teslas did you play so we, we only actually had one Tesla, um, ah, okay. but what, what we did, we, we got hold of the, uh, it's a really interesting system, the instrument cluster and the, the central information display, the IVI, actually use the same uh, processing board and they hold copies of each other's firmware. So to buy a CID with that massive screen is, is thousands of pounds. Whereas to buy an instrument cluster is about £300. So what we did is we bought instrument clusters to reverse engineer um, because working directly with a, you know, a thou thousands of pounds worth of device that would you know, stop the car working is scary. Yeah. Um, and um, the, do you think your, the VPN method was skilled because the work you've done? Uh, no, um, 
it, it was it was so we've got a reasonable contact at uh, at Tesla and security and it was it was killed it was killed for other reasons i think they were they were always aware of um of how uh, it was it was a little bit shady i think one of the other things we learned with the tesla was lots of what it did back then was held together with bash scripts and and things like that um and yeah it was <sighs> They're interesting vehicles. In some ways, they're light years ahead of other ones. In other ways, they're just as bad as other vehicles. I was going to say, uh, like, following from what you just you just said, I have two questions. So, how come you chose Teslas instead of other cars? In my mind, probably because you assume they're light years ahead of any other cars. And if you're saying Teslas are still having problems, then we have serious issues, no? Yeah, I think. Um, Tesla is interesting because um, they've got a lot more control over what goes into their vehicles. They only produce a very limited model range compared to nearly every other vehicle manufacturer. And they're also very large. Um, typically, people are only making like five lines of products will, you know, make a thousand cars a year, not have many Tesla make. Um, so all of their ECUs are actually quite a bit more custom to them. Um, but also they've got if there is a problem with the Tesla, they can update the firmware in two weeks. Um, it's there's not many other automotive manufacturers that can uh, um, that can do that so quickly. You know, you need to go back to the dealer. Um, so yeah, it's because of that over-the-air updates, correct? Yeah. But yeah. You thought like if you can hack or you can re reverse engineer Tesla, that you're probably working with a car that's already ahead of a lot of other cars. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, um, yeah, that's, uh, I was, I just want to, it's, it's, it's a complex one. Um, some, some other questions have come in on the chat. So, uh, how secure is ISO 15118? Um, do you know what? I don't know. Um, I only actually started looking at that earlier this week. Um, one thing I have to say is it, it's really challenging to keep on top of standards, but it's also really challenging to work out the security implications of them until people have actually implemented solutions with them um so to, to add and uh, yeah no keep, keep uh, go ahead I'll, fin I'll add something when you finish i thought you finished yeah, no no I, yeah no go ahead so uh on the pki webinar with uh, mike nelson uh, they've done an assessment on iso 15.11.8 so people who are interested can check that webinar and also there is a white paper available on the assessment of ISO 15118. That's one point. The second point, uh, next month of July, ELAD in the Netherlands are um, hosting an online workshop on PKI. And uh, you just said like, uh, as long as it's implemented. So they will be demonstrating uh, the use of PKI, the connection between the car and the charger, the charger and the third party operator. So that is also might be interesting for for people. That does sound that does sound good. Um, I'll, send you all, the, I'll send you the link after this. Very much have to say I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. So <laughs> it, you know it's um th things like this can get a bit difficult. Um, so there's a few questions about uh, uh, V2I, uh, so that's vehicle to infrastructure. Um, again, it's kind of reaching this. It's like a bit formative at this stage. Um, it scares me really. Um, V2I, V2V, and, you know, high ADAS level cars, so, you know, almost automatic driving cars are getting very closely linked to each other. Um, and I'm not sure if we've, whilst the standards are good, I don't think we've really, we've really understood how that you can develop a system that's compliant with the standards and is secure, but can be completely broken in terms of security. Um, think like standards don't cover things like what happens if a malicious insider who's got access to the private key material does something bad with it. So it, it gets a bit scary. Um, <laughs> wide scale availability of tools such as VCDS. So VCDS is um, diagnostic software um, that I believe has been reverse engineered uh, rather than coming directly from VW. <laughs> It's interesting. Vehicles, vehicles on the market at the moment 
to perform diagnostics quite often rely on something called UDS, Unified Diagnostic Services. And you do something called security access, where you, it's kind of like a challenge response thing. And the problem is that most of the challenge response algorithms are widely known. So for a lot of vehicles, all of the ECUs will use one algorithm or for a given tier one, they will. So once that's leaked, you can start doing things like this. But again, the problem comes that if you're reverse engineering something, you don't really understand the implications of what you're doing. It might work here and now, but it might break it. I mean, we, when we're testing hardware, we always say anything we've touched, never put back into production because it might look like it's working, but it might be quite badly broken. So stuff like that does freak me out a bit. Um, someone's asked, when do you think RFID based authentication will die? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I'm not sure it'll die. I think it's got to get more secure. Um, I mean, fun fundamentally, the um, the contactless payment really is just a, a, a variant of RFID, and that's not too bad in the general scheme of things. The problem is there's all these like legacy technologies that use the UUID or the UID of cards, you know, like the identifier, or there's no crypto involved. And it, I think, I think we're still going to see it in places just because you can have a card that doesn't need a power source. Um, I don't think we're going to see it used in automotive very much, but it's common on chargers still. I think, you, you know, you can swipe a card and it'll authenticate you. We've not looked at that at all. Um, you, sorry, you, go ahead. I keep interrupting you. Did you finish your point or you wanted to say something on that? No, I finished. Okay. Um, uh, before we keep going with the questions, I wanted, uh, so in the UK, uh, right now the government uh, is in the process of passing secondary legislation to determine the ingredients of a smart charger. And their preferred option is to control these charging through the smart metering system in the UK. Okay. Have you done assessments or are you aware of an assessment done on how secure is the smart metering system? Um, I've done a lot of work on smart metering um, <laughs> and a lot of more clever people than me have. So um, let's ignore legacy stuff and go for SMETS V2, which is the kind yeah. of current up to date standard. Agree. I think that's quite good uh, on the whole. Um, the specs are pretty solid and it allows for multiple um, kind of like multiple signing entities to have to do something before an action will be carried out. The problem is that it's, it relies on machine to machine communications, i.e. automated. Um, a system's always got to have some kind of authentication that says, yes, you can do this or no, you can't. And that nearly always comes down to a human pressing a button um, and now you've got to log in. So it doesn't really matter how secure SMETS is, it's always going to have like channels coming into it that, you know, energy providers are going to have web APIs that allow them to interact with the network. People are going to find ways around that. Um, I mean, I, I think that, that it could be a good idea. My concern would be that doing that in EV, I, I think Smets V2 has taken a long time to get to where it is. And if you need to change something, it's it can take months or even years. I don't think the EV market should be constrained like that. The The impact if if EV chargers were, say, disabled, I think would be less than if every single smart meter was disconnected or bricked or disconnected and bricked, you know, so we couldn't turn them back on. Um, and I think it, it could be quite stifling for innovation. Security is always got to balance with business. You know, Th there's no point in having a completely secure system that never hits the market. It, you know, you've got to make money as well. It's always a balance. Wow, there's a lot of questions coming through. Yeah. Um, so someone's asking about how Tesla's supply chain differs from the traditional makers. Um, I mean, Tesla directly develops certain components in their vehicle. So the software running on the CID we looked at, you know, that's, that's pure Tesla. The, um, the body control module, it's made by a company called Petron in the Model S. Again, the firm on that's really, really custom to what they do. What it looks like is they've got um, stronger relationships with the tier ones to say, we need this fixed and we need it fixed now. I don't know if they've done that contractually or if they're just, you know, they're nice to them or something like that, but they, they managed to get things done quicker. Um, but a major advantage of the Tesla um, 
if we if we look back to the slide right at the beginning that I showed with the um, <clears throat> with the car, you've got two different CAN buses with this body control module, and it's connected to the IVI and the TCU. Quite often, it's quite hard to get to these kind of like some of the different points on the vehicle from the TCU. It's, they're not directly connected. They need to go through the BCM and things like that. The Tesla's got five different CAM buses that all get connected directly to that CID and it can interact with all of them really, really easily, um, which means that they do, they do, it's almost like glue logic. The CID will read the rain sensor in Linux and turn on the windscreen wipers. So there's no direct message going between the rain sensor and the windscreen wipers, the CID does it. Uh, and they can kind of like write a little bash script that does that or write a little program and it, that gives them a lot of flexibility. So even if their supply chain control is not brilliant, they can still make the car do really interesting things. Um, wow, lots and lots of questions. Um, how to get camera data out of a Tesla for a crash. Now, um, there is a uh, essentially a black box in a Tesla. They did actually provide um, the software and a, a cell, a harness to connect to that to read it out. We didn't actually look at that. Um, it, in a lot of vehicles, the thing that records crash data is actually in the seatbelt restraint or the restraint module. Um, so the thing that you know tensions the seatbelts when you crash, um, just because it's central in the vehicle and it gets a signal saying you're crashing. Um, that's where it's stored. What we actually found is when the Tesla the Tesla hits a near crash situation. It stores the images on a SD card in the CID. You have to take the dashboard out to get to it. You can take that out, you can get the images. So we could see the one we had, had a few near misses in the past where they'd come very, very close to rear ending someone. So the ADAS had kicked in and said, whoa, you're gonna hit someone. Right, next one, car relay attacks. Uh, yeah, after oh. this one, I'm just, I noticed the time I have to ask. Yeah. Smart charging, so please go ahead. Um, I'll just, so let me just have a look. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe move on to um, Tesla ECU the seed and key for UDS security access. Um, generally, yeah, they would norm, normally using seed and key with a simple challenge response algorithm, no private public key. Um, interestingly, the way they stage firmware to get to the kind of peripheral ECUs, they put them onto the CAN gateway, um, which is running um, a little RTOS, real-time operating system, and that contains the other half of the UDS lock-unlock mechanism. So because they want to be able to stage the firmware on a small microcontroller, and then it unlocks the ECUs one by one, both halves of the, the algorithm are contained on the ECU and the CAN gateway, which gives you that central point where you can take them and reverse engineer them. We didn't really look into that um, in huge depth. And I've only had two bananas today as well. <laughs> 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 yeah, so um, I, th I think that probably is time then. Unless you have a couple of minutes left. Oh yeah, I do. Um, Excellent. No, we do, but we just wanted to make sure that we're not taking um, more of your time. Oh no, no, it's fine. Um, car relay <laughs> attacks mitigation if the key data is impacted. So car relay attacks. Um, I don't know if, I guess most of the audience here is from the UK. Really common here, you, you have two boxes, you put one near the keys, say at someone's front door, um, and then you put another box next to the vehicle. It relays the, the signal between the two of them, unlock the vehicle. Now, none of them really seem to steal the data. It's just relaying it, taking that, that cryptographic data. It's really hard to mitigate against that, to be honest. Um, I've not seen any good solutions to it. Um, fundamentally, relay attacks are really challenging to prevent against. Uh, you get things like time of flight checks, um, but they're, they're fraught with issues and reliability problems. And you can, you've got this problem. You don't want to lock people out of their cars. Like if someone can't unlock their car and they're genuinely trying to unlock it, your security mechanism might harm them. They might be trying to get into their car quickly to get away from something. So it's kind of awkward. Um, and yes, the, the, Tesla, the Tesla images are, uh, are mainly meant for uh, crash investigators. We, do, we, do, we did do some work with a company that does recover them from Teslas. Um, they're actually a bit more open than a lot of manufacturers. You know, anybody can buy the, the kit to get it, but I think it's about $600. So it's quite a lot. Um, I, think, I think that might be it. Uh, 
uh, back to the, the this, uh, um, maybe one last question, back to the smart charging um, uh, topic. Uh, we talked about the legislation and, and the government is trying to let the industry decide what are the ingredients of smart charger, etc. Definitely, a Raspberry Pi is not an ingredient, as per your talk. Yeah. You like, also gave a bit of best practice. At the end of the talk, you, you said, you, you gave, uh, you highlighted things that we need to ensure. What are the technologies that to ensure identity and authenticity? So, um, most of it, most of it's really quite simple. Um, the, the thing is, when, when you want to bake an identity into a device, that means you've got to somehow program that into it at some point. Um, and we call that a leap of faith. At some point, you've got to take that hardware and you've got to say, I trust this hardware. I'm going to give it an identity that I trust. Now, the EO chargers, what they did was the first time you powered them up, they went to a server and they downloaded their short identity, but they downloaded that identity. And the problem is that leap of faith is now happening in an insecure environment. So you've got to be able to configure your devices in a secure factory. Now, one of the technologies that we like to see in devices that have got to be quite high security, something um, uh, called an HSM or a secure element. So it's a little chip and it securely stores an identity. Um, and that identity can't be extracted. So the private key is in that little chip and you, you know, the NSA could get it out maybe, but we can't, we can't get it easily. We can still take that identity. We can desolder that chip from a charger and put it in our own device and use that identity, but we're not cloning it. So as long as that device can only impact one device, you've not got too much of a problem. The, I think one of the big things as well is that charging infrastructure is going to last four years, um, as in multiple years. You know, ideally a, a charger should sit on the street for 10 years or something like that, and you should be able to push firmware updates to it securely. So you need that firmware signing, you need that secure boot. The problem is that silicon vendors, the people actually making the chips that go into these things. So we're looking at, you know, people like NXP, we're looking at people like MediaTek, Broadcom, all these different chip vendors, just don't make it easy for developers to do that. They don't have a ready-made secure boot solution. They don't have a ready-made firmware signing mechanism. So everyone's rolling their own. They're doing their own thing. And that, that's wasted time and effort. I, so much rather see that they developed a platform that did things securely um, so yeah it's um it, it, there's a lot of different requirements we've got a couple of blog posts that i can send out um of things that that we've we've asked silicon vendors to do and we're asking iot manufacturers to think about um, yeah, that would be excellent and, and that leads me to the final comment is Twitter the best place for people to find you and to know more about your work and the other talks that you've done and the blog posts? Um, I mean, I talk a lot about bananas, <laughs> but <laughs> at the same time, um, uh, I do, yeah, Twitter does generally contain a lot of interesting content along these lines. You've just got to filter out um, my tweets about bananas and things like that. Um, the Pentest Partners blog, which is just pentestpartners.com, we do a lot of IoT stuff. I do have to say our, our most like interesting attacks and things aren't public because they're quite often paid work yeah. one of the things we couldn't do with eo in this example we couldn't actually connect to their cloud platform and send malicious messages because you know we couldn't try and impact other charges or push a firmware update because that'd be breaking the law so our most interesting work is always found on paid engagements things that we're paid to look and find vulnerabilities but we do try to make them generic and publish them still thank you andrew anything would like you would like to add before we close uh no no that's it i think um i really thanks for everyone for listening and thanks for the interesting questions and thanks for having me well thank you it was a pleasure bye Great. thank you bye